Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are coming live from the studio in Oslo. Uh, it's raining today, but that's, that's life. Summer, we have to wait a little bit for summer. So welcome to today's webinar that we have named the Nordic Battery Scene. And in order to realize this vision, we have worked closely together with some important partners of us. And that's the Eide Cluster, the Northvolt Company, Hydro, the Confederation of Norwegian Enterprise, and Sintef. Uh, they are all representatives of the Norwegian and the Nordic battery value chain. My name is Nora rosenberg Robeck, and I lead the Battery Initiative for Innovation Norway and Invest in Norway. Invest in Norway is the investment promotion agency for Norway, and we work with attracting foreign companies uh, to locate and grow in Norway. So with me today, I have my colleague Theo Skeyen, who works with the energy sector from our Stockholm office. This is the first webinar uh, in a series of three um, around the theme, the Nordic battery scene. We have a long program uh, with our presenters on Teams today, um, and we're looking forward to spending a few hours with you this morning. Thank you, Nura. Good morning, everyone. The Nordic battery scene is thriving. We see strong national initiatives. And when mapping the battery sector across the Nordic countries, we get a picture of a strong ecosystem throughout the whole value chain. This is also one of the reasons we wanted to take a Nordic approach on this webinar series. We believe that a strong collaboration will, can give the Nordic countries a unique position, contributing to build a strong, sustainable European battery industry. And today, I represent both Sweden and Norway. As we said, we have a very exciting program for you today. Uh, but before we start, uh, we have a little message from our Norwegian Prime Minister, Alma Solberg. Thank you. Dear Vice President Sefcovic and distinguished guests, right now we are tackling the vast economic consequences of the virus outbreak. But the need for a greener shift is just as urgent as it was before the corona crisis hit us. This uh, webinar is an important opportunity to discuss how the Nordic countries can work together and contribute to further development of the European battery industry. Because even though we stay apart right now, we have to stay united as we strive for a greener, more sustainable world. Batteries play a significant part when it comes to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In line with the EU Green Deal, the aspiration is that batteries and their components will be reused and recycled indefinitely, and thereby securing the critical raw materials remain in Europe, enabling a more circular economy. Norway is committed to contribute to this development. This month, Innovation Norway, through Invest in Norway, became a member of the European Battery Alliance. Already, the Norwegian maritime industry is at the forefront of developing new technology and adapting new environmentally friendly solutions. The private and public sectors are working together to increase the pace of this development. Norway has a unique position when it comes to battery development and production. Battery production is a very energy intensive and easy access to affordable, renewable energy is crucial. In Norway, 98% of all electricity comes from renewable resources. And we are at home to primary producers of many raw materials used in batteries. By taking advantage of this, we can contribute to make the battery industry even greener. But we have to work together as you are doing today. By joining forces, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and create new and green jobs in the battery industry. Thank you so much.
Prime Minister, both Norway and Sweden have set ambitious goals in the national policies for cutting the greenhouse gas emissions. This to achieve the targets of the Paris Agreement. Innovation, developing new solutions are needed to reach these targets. Norway has a unique starting point uh, and a long history of process industry. This emerged from the Industrial Revolution thanks to the development of the hydropower resources in Norway. This gives Norway a unique starting point to pave the way for the green transition. We now want to welcome the Minister of Petroleum and Energy of Norway, Tina Bru, which will give us the opening remarks. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and here is like a quick your guest. First, thank you uh, to Norway for the invitation to this webinar about the future prospects of a Nordic battery value chain. I guess we all over the last four months have become quite used to these virtual meeting places, and I personally think they work surprisingly well. But I must admit, I still look very much forward to meeting you all in person. I hope it will be soon. But in a world anxiously and increasingly worried about climate change, the surge in generation of renewable energy over the past 20 years offers hope. We must remember the variable nature of wind and solar power supply means that balancing the power grids and storing the energy until consumers need it has become the next big challenge. Therefore, large-scale battery installations are being set up across electricity grids around the world to make them more flexible. Several places in the world, battery installations are being deployed to supply services to national grids. And such solutions are increasingly important to help match supply and demand as a growing amount of intermittent wind and solar power comes online. But the market is still in a very early phase. We are just beginning to see the second generation of battery powered vehicles. Ultra fast charging will, however, be vital to helping electric cars go mainstream. While a typical home will take hours to fully top up a car, some new public chargers will do it in just a few minutes. However, the energy density required for heavy transportation makes it harder for batteries to beat fossil fuels. It's definitely more challenging, and I believe that for heavy, heavy transport and ships, hydrogen and its derivatives can become a very good alternative. And earlier this month, in fact, I launched the government's hydrogen strategy together with our Minister of Climate and the Environment. And as you know, hydrogen is an energy carrier and as batteries can be used as a storage medium that can contribute to reduced emissions and value creation for the industry. And when it comes to production of the energy needed both for hydrogen and battery production, Norway has the very best conditions to do so in an environmentally and climate friendly way. We have plenty of available renewable energy sources. It might also be possible to use stranded wind and power and hydropower as sources to produce energy carriers such as batteries and hydrogen. And in Norway, we do very much believe that the future will become more and more electric especially when it comes to the transportation system. And the government has therefore pushed for this development by granting tax exemptions on electric vehicles, supporting the maritime industry and in adopting electric vessels, and making sure we still have attractive framework conditions to develop renewable energy. I therefore also hope that Norway can lead the way on electric mobility. And electrification is also a key part of the industry's strategies to cut emissions on the Norwegian continental shelf. Offshore wind can be an important source of renewable energy for the platforms and subsea installations in the North Sea. And I am very much looking forward to seeing the results of the floating wind project, High Wind Tumpen. 
But sustainable development is not possible without access to sustainable energy. In order to provide energy for all, contribute to poverty reduction, and to fight global warming, we need to increase the share of sustainable energy on a global level. The transition to sustainable energy systems also presents a major opportunity when, it, when this is based on viable business models and involvement of the private sector. In Norway's experience is that renewable energy has been a key factor in our social and economic developments. I am very pleased to see that Norwegian industry clusters and investors like Freyr, Moro Batteries and Beyonder all see business possibilities in the battery value chain. And the use of renewable energy sources is certainly a cornerstone of sustainable energy management in order to prevent further resource depletion. Sustainable hydropower development has been important for Norway since we started hydropower development domestically from around 1900. And hydropower here was used as a tool to develop our regions economically by providing power to new industries. Local communities were benefiting from economical transfer from the power companies to the local communities through multiple taxes, concessional power, funds, and as well as, of course, access to affordable electricity. And hydropower development over many decades has put Norway in a good position to meet today's challenges and also to export electricity outside Norway. Almost all of the Norwegian electricity is produced by hydropower. Electricity thus amounts to a very high electrification rate and provides a solid foundation for increasing e-mobility and other uses. A relatively large freshwater storage capacity, totaling about 50% of Europe's reservoir capacity, has given us a very flexible power system. It is kind of like a gigantic battery when put to good use. It is well suited to support further integration of intermittent sources such as wind power. And the power market in the Nordic countries and Northern Europe is an effective way of cross-border cooperation, securing an effective resource utilization. It brings good economical, climate, and, and environmental benefits. And two new interconnectors are under construction from Norway to England and Germany, and they will provide new opportunities for hydropower producers. And of course, we also have wind power here, here in Norway. It is becoming a, a, a larger part of our total production, now counting 4%. We have 36 wind power plants with an installed capacity of 1,200 megawatts. Our first wind farm came in production in 2002, while the last year's investments have increased considerably. Electrification is also a key part of the industry's strategy to cut emissions on the Norwegian continental shelf. An offshore wind can be an important renewable source of energy to the platforms and subsea installations. With opening of the areas for offshore renewables in the North Sea that we did just a few weeks ago, we are entering a new era for floating offshore wind in Norway. So to sum up, in Norway, we consider ourselves an important partner to Europe in its energy transition with an increased amount of renewable energy coming online now and in the years to come. We can store water in dams when electricity production exceeds consumption, and we can export to Europe when demand increases. Production of batteries contributes to make the world electric with the help of renewable energy. This is definitely a sustainable pathway going forward. I am convinced that we are just in the beginning of major developments within battery technologies when it comes to storage capacity and use. Thank you so much for your attention and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, uh, Minister Bru, for, uh, for that interesting uh, introduction. Um, we will now open for a short Q&A session with us here in the studio. And we also want to add that the, this uh, stream is also being taped. 
uh, for, for viewers who want to, to look at this later again as well. So um, I will start the Q&A off. Um, some of the politicians that we talk to see that uh, battery supply chain is uh, future oriented and fits like a glove for Norway as an energy nation, as a pilot for serial emission uh, solutions for land and water, and as a home uh, to the world's most sustainable process industry. Uh, we are not the only country wanting to take this position. So how will or should uh, the government work to optimize energy production, energy consumption, and value creation in Norway in the future. Please, uh, Minister. Uh. Well, thank you. I mean, that is a, uh, it's a big question, but I think, of course, uh, Norway has shown over many years that um, by producing renewable energy efficiently at low cost, and making that uh, available for industry, we are very well situated to be an attractive place, in my view, for investments in new industry. And if you are uh, looking for somewhere to invest and you also want to make sure that you can have power that is produced without emissions for your industry or your factory or your manufacturing, where else better than Norway to do just so? Um, so I think Norway over many years has really um, try to to um, to work with what we already have. We have abundant natural resources. We know how to put them to use. And in the longer term, I think it's important that government um, makes sure that we have a strong and efficient grid, that it's well suited for both big, big users like industry, but also uh, consumers and, and other areas of our society that we're going to need to to increase increasingly electrify like transportation for example but we need to keep producing uh, renewable energy and we need to make sure that it's available and cheap and to add on to it i think i'd like to say even though it's not my main area of responsibility here in norway but i would also like to point out that we have very highly skilled workers and um, and employ employees here in Norway that uh, are fit for the job and are industry leaders for the future. Thank you for a very good answer, um, comprehensive answer uh, to a big question. Later in the program, we will hear the, from the EU Commission Vice President Sefcovic. We know that the EU um, is committed to ensuring a comprehensive battery value chain in Europe. And in your opening remarks, you mentioned electric mobility. And Norway has been subsidizing uh, the electric transportation market for quite some time now. And by that, we have ensured in the country, giving us a strong position. And given our strengths, uh, being powered by close to 100% renewable, energy sources, also being a high quality supplier to Europe on materials such as aluminium, silicon, um, battery materials like nickel, this should help us manifest this position in Europe. And seeing our position in the EV market as an investment, um, shouldn't Norway also participate in the value chain to ensure return on that investment? based on the strengths we have in Norway? Um, well, I think, yeah, I mean, of course we can, um, we can be a part of that in different kinds of ways, though. I don't think Norway is not a big car producing country, and I really don't think that we're going to be a car producing country in the future either. But that doesn't mean that we're not making substantial contributions to moving this market forward, like you pointed out yourself. I mean, the fact that we have had this very, very um, lucrative tax regime for EV vehicles has definitely, in my view, helped uh, make that a bigger market and moving that forward. But of course, um, uh, industry creating the batteries that these cars need, uh, like we've talked about today, um, or uh, maybe even hydrogen that we're talking a lot about, which is also important in this value chain. I see great opportunities for Norway, but I think we need to build on what we're already good at. I think that's smart. Uh, and I also really don't believe that government should pick the winners, but I think business and industry needs to lead the way. And we can, of course, uh, 
uh, we can share, we can back back it up with both uh, incentives and and also financing uh, in pilot phases and startup phases. But uh, it also has to be something that industry wants to take part of in Norway. But definitely, I see great opportunities in all these different value chains, uh, value chains in a green perspective moving forward. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, Norway is not a big uh, car producer, but we know that uh, the automotive industry in, in Europe is quite big, employing more than 14 million people. So it's a good opportunity for, for Norway to, to support the European uh, automotive in industry. We have our strengths being uh, mm -hmm. run um, on renewables. We are investing more and more in offshore wind also, as you also mentioned in your opening remarks. But will this create jobs? Um, within the battery supply chain, we know that the gigafactories, um, we have the first one being built in, in Sweden at the moment, they are forecasted to have 1,500, 2,000 employees. When we include suppliers, recycling, and society at large, one gigafactory can quickly provide tens of thousands of jobs. And furthermore, it can provide export values based on Norwegian renewable energy. And having this in mind, should the Norwegian authorities be working mm -hmm. towards a clearer strategy, battery strategy, as they are currently doing in both Finland and Sweden? Well, I think firstly, the uh, things that you mentioned about uh, possibilities both on, on work numbers, et cetera, in the battery business, I think those that a lot of that is the same for, for offshore wind opportunity. I mean, it's still too early to see. We, we don't know yet, but we are, we are seeing possibilities. And I think definitely there will be value creation in offshore wind power here in Norway. And it's not mostly for us about uh, just producing that energy. It's about building new industry in Norway that kind of can, can stand on, on the shoulders of what we're already really good at in Norway, like our maritime industry, our oil and gas industry. And of course, I think that will be, uh, be great opportunities both for, for jobs here in Norway, but also in an export kind of uh, sense. But I mean, uh, yes, please, thank you both. I wouldn't mind us also being, being on battery uh, value chain uh, and, and having that here in Norway. I think the conditions are, are fit for that as well. I mean, if you, like I said earlier, if someone has a, a grand idea of coming somewhere to, to build a factory to produce batteries, where else better to do it in Norway where the energy is cheap and clean? I think that itself is a, is a good selling point. Um, but I, I, again, I don't think we can pick the winners. Our, our job as government is to, to make sure the framework is good, that the opportunity is there, and that we can back it up. But I still think the industry needs to lead the way on, on most of these things. Yeah, thank you again, uh, Minister Bru, for uh, talking to us this morning. Uh, we know uh, you have uh, a busy day and uh, there is uh, lots to do be done before the summer. And um, so thank you for taking part, uh, part this morning. Um, our next guest uh, is not a stranger in the European battery ecosystem. Vice President Sekovic from the European Commission is soon entering our digital stage today. Uh, Vice President Sekovic will give us an insight to the status of Green Deal and new industry strategy, and also commenting on the industry in the light of COVID-19. Uh, the European Battery Alliance will be a central theme as well. And as the Prime Minister mentioned in her greeting, Innovation Norway recently became a member of the European Battery Alliance. Um, so we are very happy about that and excited to see where we can contribute going forward. So without further ado, uh, the digital stage um, is yours, uh, Mr. Vice President. Thank you very much and uh, good morning and thank you. Or should uh, then be a Tusen Tag to the Prime Minister Solberg and Minister Bru for those kind words of welcome, but also for introducing us uh, to the situation in uh, Norway. I'm very honoured that I could be participant in this uh, digital discussion. And I also would like to thank Innovation Norway and uh, their partners for organising this uh, webinar and inviting me to speak to you. 
As you know, yeah. uh, batteries are not okay, only but... the key technology uh, for the future of the planet, but uh, they're also very close to my heart. As is the cooperation, which is excellent uh, with Norway, something uh, I uh, had the chance uh, to enjoy in uh, my previous mandate as a vice president of the Energy Union, uh, during which I visited uh, Norway at several occasions. And the fact is that since the oil was discovered in the Norwegian waters in December 1968, Norway has been a key partner and crucial player in Europe's energy industry. And that is not changing as we decarbonize and transition to greener forms of uh, energy. The battery industry is key uh, to this uh, transition and it's a truly European endeavor across the European Union and its closest uh, partners. So allow me also to express my gratitude to the decisive role that industrial actors, not only from Norway, but also from Sweden and Finland have, uh, have played in helping us to establish a competitive, sustainable and resilient battery value chain in Europe. This part of the world uh, has long been a leader in innovation in uh, the European uh, Innovation Scoreboard, in, uh, which was published just uh, last week, uh, you would indeed saw those uh, three countries, as well as Denmark, rank among the Europe's best uh, uh, innovators. And you don't have to look too far to find uh, this kind of innovation being used in the field of batteries, uh, thanks to a uh, scheme being planned in Oslo, for example. And I very much look forward to visit you again and to take uh, electric uh, taxi, which is uh, being recharged uh, virusly. So uh, it's no wonder that the region has become such an important player in uh, electromobility with its vast experience in refining raw materials such as cobalt, lithium, nickel, using green energy, and its deep knowledge of a circular economy management such as waste processing and recycling. And of course, the experience in amical processes such as production of aluminium and fertilizers is also very important. This expertise will not only increase uh, once the new lithium ion battery uh, gigafactory in Sweden and other uh, early stage projects in uh, Norway when they will come online. So I'll come back to my introductory, uh, introductory remarks uh, when uh, I was uh, referring to the companies such as uh, Elkem, Talga, Hydro, Vattenfall, Adger Energy, uh, which are really very known industrial players, and I would even say uh, the industrial uh, leaders at the front line of uh, these efforts. And we are in close cooperation and very much appreciate uh, how these companies also help Europe to maintain its uh, competitive edge in design, innovation and uh, sustainability. And with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, I would say accelerating the twin uh, green and digital transition, uh, we need innovation now more than ever. With batteries, uh, we have already made a strong start. In uh, 2017, as uh, I'm sure you know, together with uh, industrial actors coordinated by InnoEnergy, I established the European Battery Alliance to develop an innovative, sustainable and competitive battery value chain. And the batteries are undoubtedly uh, vital uh, including for Europe's automotive industry, which today deploy, employs 14 million people, as it was already said by the minister, and provides over 7% of the EU's GDP. What we expect is that by 2030, over 50% of passengers' vehicles sold in the EU will be electric, compared to 2 or 3%, uh, which is the case now. Three years on, and uh, the European Battery Alliance is already a resounding success. It showcases the 21st century approach to the industrial policy of the EU and its partners. It also combines the support for strategic value chains in an integrated way with the environmental objectives. The European Battery Alliance has so far attracted around 440 industrial actors uh, and some 100 billion euros in investment in the drive to create a globally competitive and sustainable Europe battery industry, which we hope will provide up to 4 million jobs by 2025. It is a flagship 
Alliance for Europe providing a ready-to-use blueprint for other strategic sectors, for example, the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, which will uh, be launched next month, and Alliance on Rare Earth and Magnets, which is expected later this year. But perhaps the biggest success of the EBA is uh, how it has changed the mindset around batteries in Europe. There is now a wider understanding of the essential role of batteries in delivering the EU's strategic objectives of industrial competit competitiveness, decarbonization of the economy, and increased resilience and strategic autonomy in critical industrial sectors. There is also growing recognition of the need to reduce our over-dependence on third countries, both for batteries and the raw materials needed to make them crucial to boosting our strategic autonomy and uh, reliance in this area. For example, 73% of the batteries bought in the EU are made in China and only 6% in Europe. And it's a similar picture with the key raw materials. 48% of graphite is imported from China. 68% of cobalt uh, from the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, and 78% of lithium from Chile. So it's very important for us to make sure that uh, we will look closer at uh, this challenge. And as you know, I work very closely with my fellow commissioners on work stream related uh, to batteries in areas such as industrial strategy, financing and research and innovation. And uh, that means uh, that uh, uh, batteries would feature high on the Commission's political agenda and a part of its strategic uh, initiations such as the European Green Deal, the circular economy and the COVID-19 recovery strategy adopted last month. And I also have to say that while the pandemic has had a devastating impact on our economy, not to mention its horrific human cost, it has not changed our strategic objectives. On the contrary, there is now a need to accelerate our efforts and push for a truly sustainable and digital European industrial policy to boost our recovery and increase societal and industrial resilience. Game changing new clean uh, technologies are key to Europe's uh, future, including in its ability to continue to be a global economy and a global actor. So it is vital we put them at the core of the recovery, not only because many of them, including batteries, have the potential to boost the economic growth and create jobs, but also because they will contribute to making Europe fairer, greener and more digital as well as more resilient. This, of course, will require significant cooperation and joint effort from the EU, its member states and partner countries and industrial actors. Now it's the time to mobilize all our resources across the whole value chain and press hard on the accelerator of the European Battery Alliance. So how do we drive the European battery ecosystem ahead? There are four main strands of work which are essential to speed up the delivery of the European battery ecosystem. First, we need to provide industry with a robust, comprehensive and fit for future regulatory framework to ensure that batteries placed on the EU market, regardless of their origin, meet the highest standards in terms of performance, durability and safety, as well as a responsible sourcing of the raw materials and environmental impact, which includes the carbon footprint over the entire life cycle. The new framework will be complemented by the high quality and timely standards developed uh, by our standardization bodies, SEN, Senelec, and there we need to move quickly on this one. And uh, our aim is to hold the first trilogue meeting with the European Parliament and the Council on the proposed regulations still uh, under German 2020 presidency. Second strand, it's very important that uh, uh, we would uh, push for increase uh, of the leveraging of investment in the strategic battery projects. Here the task is twofold. Approval of the second German-led important project of common European interest. Uh, uh, this uh, year, I believe, would be critical and uh, decisive uh, to ensuring that uh, the continuation of the strategic projects uh, in Europe will evolve further. And I believe that uh, this second very important so-called IMSE project will be completed by the end of this year. 
Then we need to prepare a strategic approach on battery financing to ensure that the substantial chunk of the enormous amount of resources available under the European recovery plan, which is a total firepower of 1.85 trillion euros, is used to support investment in batteries across the whole value chain. To this end, I'm working closely with my colleague, uh, Commissioner as well, as with the European Investment Bank, which has committed uh, to allocating 1 billion euros uh, to the batteries value chain in 2020 alone. Third, we need to step up research and innovation on batteries and ensure that the new Horizon Europe research program, which is replacing Horizon 2020 and its uh, strategic uh, uh, planning fully reflects the strategic political priorities of the Commission and that the batteries receive a uh, suitable share of uh, the 15 billion euros allocated uh, to the relevant cluster Cluster 4, which is aimed at uh, climate, energy and mobility. Our research activities uh, should, of course, span all the stages of the batteries value chains from chemicals to recycling, while also focusing on integrating research into the industrial ecosystem in order to shorten the transition from lab to the market. The newly established partnership for batteries needs to play a decisive role here. And finally, we need to continue increasing Europe's resilience with regard to critical raw materials. In the short term, that means seeing adoption of the new raw materials action plan together with the launch of the alliance on rare earth and magnets uh, by early autumn. And uh, I believe that this in turn will strengthen Europe's resilience with regard to raw materials. It would help us to reduce our dependence on third countries and it would allow the EIB financing of domestic mining and processing uh, projects which would have a positive uh, influence on the environmental and social sustainability of the supply chain. Together, I believe these measures will help to put Europe into the driving seat when it comes to batteries. So I, together with my fellow commissioners, am committing, committed to deliver on these measures in a timely manner. And as I have said, uh, However, this is a joint enterprise uh, and I also count on continued effort, cooperation and expertise as we seek uh, to fully charge Europe's battery industry. To conclude, allow me again to say uh, thank you to the organizers of this webinar as well as Inner Energy uh, for its excellent steering of the European Battery Alliance and to all of you for your commitment, hard work and personal engagement in this uh, vital undertaking. I know that uh, many of you in the Nordics are starting your summer break ne uh, next week. So let me also wish you a good summer and I hope you will be able to allow the batterien who summer, which was my best uh, Norwegian in which I wanted uh, to wish you a nice summer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Vice President. Uh, yeah, we just uh, we are sorry about the technical issues that we are facing. I just want to make sure uh, that we are working on solving it, and the live stream should be up now. Uh, also, don't worry, we will um, tape. It's uh, the, the the event has been taped, and everyone will get a link to to that uh, tape uh, right after. Uh, the show. So uh, don't worry about that. And sorry about the <laughs> sorry about the mix up. So continue. No now. problem. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. Uh, thank you for for uh, your speech, dear Vice President. And uh, you are most welcome to Norway anytime uh, <laughs> to try the autonomous electric transportation uh, project here. Um, a warm welcome. And thank you for underlining the essential roles of batteries delivering on EU strategic objectives for industrial competitiveness, the decarbonisation, resilience uh, for critical industry sectors of Europe. And also for highlighting the need for a strategic approach on battery financing to uh, increase the investment in strategic uh, battery projects, also um, mentioning the, the resources allocated by the now the European Investment Bank. You highlight uh, the sourcing of raw materials and sustainable sourcing of, of raw materials. 
Uh, this will be something we will discuss in our next webinar in August, and, uh, and uh, we will we'll pick up on, on that one. We are now opening up for a Q&A. Uh, Mr. Vice President, you will be with us a little bit longer in this Q&A. And with us to moderate this, we have representatives from the Norwegian battery cell industry. We have the CEO of Beyonder, uh, Svein Kvardstuen, Tom Jensen uh, from Frey, and Tadja Andersen from Morrow Batteries. These three companies represent cell production at uh, various maturity stages, and together they represent the, the Norwegian addition to the Nordic cell production scene. You will alternate the questions per gentleman's agreement, so please behave. And we start off by giving the floor to Tom Jensen. Thank you very much. And, uh, and dear Vice President Sefcovic, I'd just like to congratulate you on taking leadership in this critically important uh, transformational industry. Uh, also, the role that you've taken together with Inno Energy in making sure that the European Battery Alliance is such a powerful tool is something that is obviously very important uh, for the development of Europe as a resilient area for, for its own battery cell production and establish captive value chains for, for this critically important uh, industry. Now, you mentioned in several locations raw materials and the, the critical link that raw materials play uh, strategically in this value chain. Could you expand a little bit on the measures that the EU is taking uh, to, to ensure that we don't risk shifting ourselves uh, from a dependence on fossil fuels rather to a dependence on raw materials. It would be great to get some ad added perspectives on the specific initiatives that are being undertaken to ensure that we can also create uh, a more resilient raw material supply chain in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tom, for for the for your kind words, but also for putting the uh, very pertinent uh, question. I think that we all uh, are realizing right now that if you are talking about raw materials, especially the critical raw materials, so this is the new uh, big thing, and therefore this is one of our priorities uh, upon which we'll be working uh, together with the commissioners, especially with uh, uh, Thierry Breton during uh, this mandate. We, I think, realized even more under the latest uh, pandemic uh, crisis how the raw materials and strategic value chains are very important for the good uh, performers, uh, performance of the European economy. And the uh, raw materials uh, are of uh, critical importance if it comes uh, to the future-oriented, game-changing technologies and uh, sectors. I think we uh, want, as uh, I said in my introductory remarks, to be greener, to be to be cleaner, to be more resilient. So for that, uh, we need uh, the, the 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 new technologies like batteries, like PVs, like uh, windmills, like good computers. And the fact is that for all that, uh, we need uh, we need the raw materials uh, from uh, from from the third countries. And we are realizing and discovering how uh, the situation in supply of that uh, critical raw materials is uh, increasingly. Uh, challenges. So what we see in our pre preliminary analysis is the fact that demand for the raw materials uh, is uh, increasing. For example, the EU would need uh, just uh, for the batteries for electric uh, vehicles and energy storage up, up to 18 times more lithium in 2030 and almost 60 times more uh, lithium in 2050 uh, if, we com if we compare it with uh, today's uh, uh, consumption. And currently, as you rightly pointed out, we are heavily dependent on third countries. 48% I mean, of graphite uh, comes from China, 68% of cobalt comes from Congo, 78% of lithium comes uh, from Chile, and uh, 
almost 100%, 99% of rare earth is coming from, from China. So it's clear for us that we need to strengthen our uh, resilience with regard to the raw materials. And it has to be a key component, I would say, part of Europe's uh, strategic uh, autonomy to, uh, to ensure that we would have uh, much higher resource uh, security. And I have to say it very much reminds me of my work, which I was doing five years ago, where we've been working on uh, diversifying of uh, fossil fuel supplies, uh, making sure that we have well-working internal market, that we have proper interconnection among our member states. So we would never be uh, uh, put in the situation where we could be blackmailed by, by, by anyone or pushed into the tight corner where we really uh, be very much squeezed if it comes to our future economic uh, choices. Therefore, this autumn, we will adopt the first strategic foresight uh, report uh, looking at uh, the resilience across the board with concrete uh, case studies, including one on uh, the raw materials. We, we are going to work with a number of uh, indicators where we will try to measure and monitor uh, the, this continual evolving state of vulnerability and resilience capacity with regards to the raw materials. What we need is to adapt the strategic uh, uh, approach uh, to the raw materials with our other uh, policies. And therefore, we also want uh, to make sure that uh, we are going to uh, kind of replicate the lessons learned from the Battery Alliance and we will um, adopt uh, the, the action plan for raw materials and at the same time to launch a strategic dedicated uh, alliance on rare earth and uh, magnets. We are thinking currently about three work streams. The first one would be on diversification of supply uh, of routes of critical raw materials, especially nickel and cobalt, by making greater use of uh, the trade diplomacy, uh, by concluding new bilateral uh, agreements where in our, for example, free trade agreements would be a dedicated clause on sustainable mining, processing and, and uh, supply. Then we want to offer greater support to domestic sustainable sourcing of primary raw materials. And here we are looking at such a twofold approach. First, facilitation of permitting procedures and access to financing. And um, in uh, this context, uh, already uh, this year, we are going to update the critical raw materials uh, list. Uh, and uh, we definitely will put uh, the lithium on it because EIB could support the economically uh, viable lithium mining projects in Europe even more. Currently, just for your information, we have uh, four projects in a, in a pipeline in Portugal, in Spain, uh, in uh, Czech Republic uh, and in France. Our estimate is if uh, all these four projects would go ahead already uh, by the mid of the next decade, we would be able to cover around 80% of processed lithium because we do not want to mine. We also want to process the lithium, which is important for our battery projects. And the third uh, work stream should be uh, the, the reduction of the need for primary critical raw materials through circular uh, economy. And I think that uh, this is the key objective for upcoming regulation and batteries. We want to collect uh, the used materials, reuse them, recycle them, and I believe it would uh, put us in a much uh, better situation. So these are just few ideas uh, which uh, I would uh, uh, tell you upon which we are working right now, but uh, you are you're absolutely correct. This is a big challenge and this is uh, really very uphill walk, but I'm sure that we will find a good solution to resolve it. Thank you very much, Thank you very much. And, uh, and good luck and we hope to be able to support it as much as we can. As we can. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President, uh, for a very interesting uh, speech. And uh, I also appreciate uh, your focus on the four strengths that you mentioned. You have in these mentioned that the sustainability, which is extremely important, could be a great contributor to the competitive advantage of Europe on batteries. Could you please give a bit more details about the legislation that is in the making on this? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Swain. And, and, you, and you rightly pointed out that once we see the 
uh, batteries as a, as, a, as, a, as a game changer in how we are going to make European economy uh, uh, greener and, and cleaner, of course, uh, the role of the batteries uh, is irreplaceable. And we discovered very quickly that what our industry expects from us and what it needs and how we can best uh, chart our way forward, uh, this is uh, through the appropriate battery regulation. And we want to see also this as a game changer uh, in, the, in, the, in the way how we are uh, uh, how we are working on the future uh, oriented uh, technologies and I believe that it would uh, have the same effect as a, um, as a emission uh, regulation and emission trading scheme had on the uh, European uh, economy. Why is it so important uh, if you just look at uh, the first quarter of, of this year? And we all know that there was a huge crisis that was extremely difficult for everyone. But the fact is that the sale of uh, electric uh, vehicles in the first quarter of uh, this year, if you compare it to the first quarters of 2019, despite all the difficult circumstances, so the, uh, there were more electric uh, vehicles sold uh, in Europe. If you look at Germany, the increase of was of 148%. In France, it was 123%. In Sweden, 87% more of electric vehicles uh, been been sold, comparing to the last year. And at the same time, we saw that there was the, the reduction of sales of uh, combustion uh, engines. In France, 25%. Uh, in Germany, 25%, France, 39%, and Sweden, also 25%. So I think it's also seen that despite the difficult circumstances, also, I would say, the, 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 the mood of the consumer is shifting and they're much more conscious about the environmental impact uh, of smart mobility and, um, and electric uh, uh, vehicles. So therefore, we are putting a lot of efforts and we are working very hard to prepare this new fit for future comprehensive regulatory framework for uh, batteries and as i said we really want to adopt it uh, in october we want to address all the critical aspects uh, including due diligence uh, on responsible sourcing of raw materials we want to measure carbon uh, carbon footprint uh, covering the whole life cycle uh, performance and durability would be very important for us. As I mentioned, circular economy, recycling, and the battery passport. I believe that uh, through this regulation, we would uh, have also the possibility to be much more effective in market uh, surve surveillance and auditing. And uh, that would help us to be more uh, forceful in making sure that we would be properly enforcing that regulation within uh, Europe, but also setting, I believe, the world global standards for other countries which are outside uh, of the of the EU. What we want to do is to to set the right level uh, of uh, ambition and where possible and where we have enough of the data, also with the limit uh, values, uh, depending on uh, the av availability and, of course, uh, recent updates of the data which we have uh, at our disposal. So we are clearly aiming and making sure that this regulation would become the worldwide benchmark. And uh, to make the, the difference, this regulation would require good standards, meaning methodologies and testing me method, but uh, also we want to ensure that the proposal would be accompanied by, as I said in my introductory remarks, by the strong mandate uh, to the EU standardization bodies. I'm sure that you are all from the industry, so you know Sen Senna like very well, and we want to do this process in parallel, to start negotiations on the regulations by the co-legislator with the European Parliament and member states, the Council, but also to issue immediately strong mandate for for standardization bodies so we really would proceed with the appropriate speed and and have a good uh, uh, highly valued uh, uh, regulation but at the same time very very high standard so this is I think what uh, we are planning for this year just last word on timeline as I said we would like uh, uh, to deliver the proposal by October and uh, I have uh, 
preliminary agreement with the, with the German presidency that we will both work very, very hard to make sure that uh, we will have a first uh, trilogue already by uh, the uh, end uh, of the year. So this is the plan. And as I said, uh, we want to start parallel process with the standardization body. So, so this is, I would say, very, very... Uh, a very challenging schedule, as you can imagine, but uh, <laughs> there is strong intention on our side to deliver on time because we know how important it is for the European industry. Thank you very much. It is extremely important and, uh, yes, uh, quite uh, impressive on uh, your uh, uh, ambition on this uh, rather uh, tough timeline. So thank you very much for a good uh, answer. Thank you again, uh, uh, Mr. Vice President. Uh, exciting to hear about all the initiative going on. You mentioned the important project of common European interests. What type of project are, are applying uh, these days? And what type of project should use uh, important project of common European interests going forward? And last one, do you recommend Norway to participate? in the program. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Terry. I, when we've been looking through the ways how uh, we can best uh, promote, I would say, these new technologies and also to cover what we felt was a gap on uh, European market. So we very quickly con uh, concluded uh, that the IPSAID uh, could be a right answer for certain type of the uh, industrial uh, projects uh, uh, for uh, the future. And uh, at this stage, uh, as you know, we are in the process of assessing uh, uh, the the IPSE on uh, batteries. It's called pre-notification stage, which is uh, which is a German led, uh, and I think that uh, currently. Uh, there are around 14 uh, members who are interested uh, in it, uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, very important uh, market players, important companies uh, who are uh, who are presenting their the projects. And here again, the the schedule is uh, very tight. Uh, so uh, we believe that uh, by the end of this year. Hopefully, all the work on this would be concluded uh, from the side of the companies, but also from uh, from the side uh, of the uh, European uh, of the European Commission. And uh, we, I think, are also going to uh, benefit uh, from the from the experience we gathered uh, during the first uh, IPSE, which was led. Uh, uh, by France, and there I think we had also very good uh, experience, and I can say that uh, um, in record time we managed to achieve very good results. Overall, the the IPSES, uh, 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 as you know, this is the abbreviation for our approach, how we can approve the special state aid uh, framework for projects from all sectors of economic activity and the notify uh, project in, the, in this case have to comply with the conditions linked uh, uh, with the scheme. What they are, I mean, at first and foremost, they have to contribute uh, to the common EU uh, objectives. It means that they have to have significant impact on competitiveness of EU economy, they have to support sustainable uh, growth and also address societal challenges. The second condition is that they have to be of the major innovative uh, nature. I mean, of course, it's uh, R&D or the first industrial deployment of the new innovative technologies. And, and the third, which is also very important when we started with IPSES for batteries, this was how can we address the market failure due to a very considerable level of technological and, uh, and financial risk. And, of course, we always want uh, to have partners uh, from the private sector. So also the IPSE projects uh, must uh, involve the private financing by the uh, beneficiaries. And it has to have this, I would say, across the, the, the border nature. So it should involve several member states with uh, uh, 
uh, wider benefits for the European economy. So these are, I would say, the criteria against which we are considering the uh, the, the IPSE projects when uh, presented uh, to us. I have to say that uh, uh, my colleague, Margaret uh, Vestager, the vice president responsible for competition, did a marvelous job on this because I think we really developed the new way how to how to promote uh, the, the technologies which are so so crucial for the European uh, uh, twin transition uh, uh, success. And then, of course, uh, uh, in the process, we are communicating uh, very closely with uh, the EU member states, uh, but uh, uh, not only, because there is very close cooperation with EFTA authorities, and this is for the uh, member states and companies involved uh, in IPSE to decide which countries uh, can join. So I would say that the Norway would always be welcome. And just to conclude on uh, the first experience with uh, France, just to give you the perspective uh, uh, how this first IPSE uh, led, uh, um, uh, IPSE, IPSE, IPSE project led by France uh, being completed. So we had in the end seven member states Belgium, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, and, and Sweden uh, in agreement to support research and innovation in the area of uh, batteries. These seven member states uh, are providing uh, in, a, uh, in the coming years uh, more than three billion uh, of, Europe, uh, of euros in funding for this project. And the expectation is that this uh, investment would unlock uh, an additional 5 uh, billion private investment. So it's just one IPSE project. We have more than 8 uh, billion of euros invested uh, in there. And I would just recall that thanks to the great work of uh, Inno Energy and their financial uh, platform, we are now uh, see that there is uh, more than 100 billion of euros uh, channeled uh, uh, towards uh, the project uh, supporting uh, European Battery Alliance and uh, the, the, this development of uh, new uh, ecosystem, which I believe would be of the crucial importance uh, for the European industry. So thank you very much for all the three questions. Uh, they've been very much uh, to the to the point, uh, and I hope that I've been able to uh, to inform you about some additional details, which would convince you that uh, this is very important technology, and that we are very much looking forward to cooperate also with the great companies from Norway. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, um, very very interesting uh, insight. Back to the to Nora and uh, her team. Thank you, thank you guys for that, and thank you, uh, Mr. Vice President, for that interesting uh, Q and A. Um, there's no doubt that we will see a lot of activity in this sector uh, in the next couple of months, and uh, and that strong international collaboration will play a significant role um, to the growth uh, of this sector. So, next on the agenda, we have the Chairman of the Confederation of Norwegian Enterprise, Avid Moss and the chairman of the Swedish Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, Fredrik Persson. Um, they are both senior executives in, in the industry sector in the Nordics, and today we are welcoming them to a conversation around the theme how Nordic collaboration can boost the Nordic battery scene and help deliver on EU Green Deal and new industry strategy. And uh, we have them both with us now, I think. So without further ado, uh, Pearson will start this section off, followed by Moss. And, uh, so, and they will self-moderate their own conversation uh, to leave out any technical issues. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And how, how's that for a sustainable solution? And I think you're, you're a too brave person uh, leaving this to, to Arvid and I. Uh, let, let me start off uh, and, and congratulate you on a, on a great uh, seminar, but on an even greater topic. And I, I know we were gonna supposed to focus on, on batteries, but to start off, I would only like to say from uh, the side of Swedish Enterprise, I think one key here is uh, the European Green Deal. And I would like to say that from, from the Swedish side, we fully and wholeheartedly support that deal. Uh, we think it's key for getting Europe forward. It's key for a modern Europe. It's key for a competitive uh, Europe. Uh, so that is sort of at the start of what we're discussing today. 
And I, I think Sweden and the Nordic region and Norway are extremely well positioned to be in the center of the European battery industry. And I'm going to point at the some advantages or positions that we have currently. I think we're one or two steps ahead in, in Sweden, but I think Norway is trailing and have all the possibilities to, to be on the same level and to catch up. And, and the reason for that, I think, is one prime advantage and key um, winnable here is to have good and reliable supply of renewable energy. I mean, if you if you look at uh, producing a battery for every kilovolt hour of battery capacity in the production process, you need some hundred kilovolt to to get the battery done. So energy prices will be key here, and the access to sustainable and rene renewable energy will be key. So here we both have a strong advantage uh, with the hydropower we have. But, but to get ahead, it's also in, important to have a, an industrial tradition. And I would say that's served Sweden well. I mean, we have the entrepreneurs and we will later on listen to, to Northvolt. And I think nothing happens without the entrepreneurs and people with the drive. But we do have an industrial tradition of both uh, raw material extraction, but not the least also of recycling. And I think recycling is here key because we have to look at the whole value chain. I mean, stretching from the raw material extraction all the way to the recycling. And here I would uh, uh, take my hat off for, for Hydro and uh, the Norwegian initiatives that are done with uh, Northvolt on the recycling side. So here I think Norway is already playing catch up. We've already heard the discussion on uh, the rare earth metals, and I think this will be a challenge. We do not want to end up in a situation where we become as dependent on uh, metals that we are on today on fossil fuels. But I think there are some promising signs here. If you look at geological surveys, I think there could be the possibility to extract these type of metals both in Norway and in Sweden. And as said, we have a long-standing traditions of raw material extraction in Sweden, and we also have the companies that produce that type of equipment. And, and to that point, I think uh, my, uh, you also have the market uptake. To get uh, industry going, you really have to have the demand. And I think here in Norway has been a good first mover on the car scene with a high level of uh, electrified cars. And we are seeing the same to a certain extent in Sweden, but we're now also moving into the electrification of heavy uh, vehicles. And I would really like to lift the example of Swedish company Epiroc that is currently uh, electrifying the mining industry. So creating sustainable uh, mining, which is both important in terms of sustainability, but also in terms of getting the rare earth metals. My final point would be on the recycling side, looking at the whole cycle from the metal uh, extraction is now to the recycling. So that would be really, really important to have good recycling. And here I would also lift the Finnish example. We have some good examples of uh, recycling in Finland and we have a strong tradition in the whole Nordics. These were the positives. Uh, aren't there any negatives? I think there uh, is one. And there's, of course, that we have an extremely high personnel cost in the Nordic countries. And one could then, of course, ask, uh, is this a great uh, disadvantage for us as compared to the countries where we see battery production today? Uh, I would say that personnel cost is not a large part of the battery production. And we're also in the need of highly, highly skilled labor, which I think is a great advantage for both uh, Norway and Sweden. So I think that is a challenge that is definitely uh, able to, to handle. So I think uh, Sweden is maybe a step or two ahead. And I would put that uh, to uh, the strong entrepreneurs behind Northvolt, uh, the strong network of Swedish industrial companies that have been uh, supporting Northvolt. But I see no uh, a reason why we shouldn't on a Nordic level or a Norwegian level come as far. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. And uh, I can uh, subscribe to, to what you say about uh, the Green Deal uh, in Europe. I think it's extremely important for all of us that uh, we see this movement in the right direction. And 
uh, all of you should also know that the Nordic countries and and uh, and Frederick and myself, we uh, we have a, a voice in Business Europe, uh, where we really try to push the, the green agenda. And uh, I think we have we have moved some of the attitudes in in Europe, I would say, on on this topic because it's so important. Well, on on the batteries, I, I think you are right, Frederick. Uh, Sweden is is a little bit ahead when it comes to industrialization, while Norway has been ahead when it comes to introducing electric vehicles and also batteries in in the in the ferry sector. Uh, Ten years ago, one percent of the new sales was electric vehicles. Uh, this year, so far, fifty percent of the new sales of uh, passenger cars uh, are electric vehicles. So it's a fantastic uh, development, of course, with a lot of support from the from the state. But also in the, on, the, on the ferry side, we have now more than 20 ferries that are operated on batteries. And within short, that will increase to some 60 to 70 ferries. So of course, there is a, there is a market that has been developed in, in, in Norway. Uh, I think we have had good um, incentives to do this. But what has been the worry of NHO and myself has been that too little of the value creation, too little of the value chain behind this electrification is, is left in Norway. Uh, so, so we have taken some initiatives uh, also in NHO to, to look at what can be done uh, to create more, let's say, value creation in Norway, more in industry, more workplaces. I think we have a good chance going forward. And as president of NHO, I see quite a lot of things happening now uh, on, let's say, along the, the value chain from R&D to recycling. Uh, the strong R&D environment in Trondheim and in Oslo University and IFE is a good support now for many companies. Uh, of course, we have also have a lot of startups that are now emerging, small companies that are really looking for opportunities in the value chain. And then, of course, we have, as a third element, we have the strong cluster of process and material industries, the, the Elkems, the Glencores, the Hydros, etc., in, 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 in Norway. And that is a tradition to really uh, build business that matters. And batteries is really about building business that matters. This will be a big industry in, in, in the next decade. And, and uh, let's say the, the large enterprises in Norway are really uh let's say looking into opportunities now i think you have had some great entrepreneurs in sweden and we need them in norway as well but uh, i think also it's important that uh, that uh, the large enterprises involve themselves and then i would uh, again uh as, as let's say of state of, of of today the maritime industry uh just developing themselves pretty pretty fast so what is now ongoing in norway i think that the on the upstream part, uh, that means on processing of raw materials uh, and uh, what goes into uh, the cell manufacturing, there are some initiatives. Uh, Elkem is doing something on the pilot plant for anode material. But I think also when it comes to graphite, cobalt, nickel, lithium, we see some initiatives coming up uh, to start up. On cell production, uh, as we have heard already, it's, it's, uh, it's Moro, it's Freyer and it's Beyonder, that are all, let's say, in the early days of creating a foundation for cell manufacturing in Norway. On packaging and integration, both uh, Siemens and Corvus uh, have established um, specialized plants in Norway to uh, create, to deliver battery systems to the maritime sector. And as you mentioned, Frederick, on recycling, we, we just announced the 50-50 joint venture with Nordvolt. Uh, what is very good with Norway, uh, and that is also true for Sweden, is that a very good support from uh, from let's say public, uh, let's say from the from the state sector. Uh, we have Enova in Norway, uh, which uh, invests in in uh, and give grants to green projects. And uh, last year, it actually gave more than 500 million euro to to this. So it's uh, it's important to have these vehicles to get get us through the first first phase. So I, I think that we, uh, we have a lot uh, to, to, uh, to, to work on, and I think that there's a lot of interest now. And I think that the, the, the point is that this business will be built in partnerships. I think that is also why it's so important that we talk in partnerships in Norway, but it's also important to see these partnerships across Norway, Sweden, because we are, let's say, this is too big for one country. Uh, I think we can be much stronger if we work together. I think that the, the examples we have uh, talking from as my professional job in hydro, I really see that we have not 
been where we are today without uh, the joint ownership in, in Corvus with the Equinor and the Shell and the others who really took this um, forward because they wanted to develop something for the offshore and, and, the, and the oil uh, su supply side. And we had joined uh, with a small position in Northvolt last year because we saw that Northvolt was really spearheading the development and, and the cooperation with Northvolt is developing uh, gradually and, and uh, now with the joint venture on, on recycling. And we also look at other places where we can uh, mature opportunities. But all in all, Fredrik, I think that um, the dialogue uh, between the Nor Norwegian and Swedish companies uh, should be enhanced. We should really look for uh, for where we can, let's say, not only go alone, but go together. And uh, in Brussels and then the European car industry is really looking for companies like uh, like we we have in, in, in Norway and Sweden. And, uh, uh, you mentioned one one thing, uh, of course, the, the renewable power is, is very important, but you also mentioned the workforce. I think that we have a highly educated workforce with uh, with the best opportunities to, to run highly automated uh, equipment. And, and this industry needs to be very, very highly automated to be competitive. So so a lot of interesting things going on. So so, so I think it's more. So how what do we do next, uh, Frederick? So so leave, going back to you, what? What do we? What can we do more do together to to develop uh, towards the European supply chain? Thank you, Arvid. Uh, no, coming back to your question, I, I I think very much is is in the, the word producer uh, and the end part of that being user. I I think an, a huge advantage from for Sweden has been the strong industrial heritage we we have with companies like ABB, Epiroc, Atlas Copco, uh, Volvo, uh, that are really embracing the effects of sustainability and electrification, seeing that they've been producing these type of products for, for decades and centuries, and that they're now adapting to uh, the, the new normal of, of electrification. And I, I think that is such a good breeding ground when you see companies like Norfolk coming up, that if you have the user of the product, uh, you also have the skilled laborers, you have the engineers. I think we have to be realistic there on, on Nordic side that we do have a highly skilled labor force, but we always stand the risk of falling behind because we see a strong, strong development in, in India and in China when it comes to the number of engineers. So I think we also have to push in the educational system to, to, to both reskill the workforce, but to add the number of engineers in, in both our countries. Because if, if we're going to be successful, we really have to work hard on that. And I, that I know there's a lot of exchange between the universities in the Nordic region. Once uh, uh, the UK leave the EU, none of the ten, top 10 universities in the world will be within the EU. And of course, in a way, it's not within the EU, but I mean, working closely with the Danish universities, the Norwegian universities, I think we can create an educational and a university force that is really, really strong and that will help support and, and be um, a playground and a breeding ground for these type of new ideas. Mm. I agree with you, and I think that you have the uh, you have the, uh, the the Scania's and the Volvos. That is really an important consumer group over time, and and we have the maritime sector and, and exactly. the, one of the largest in the world. And and you start out with the ferries, and then you take larger and larger vessels. And and I think that of course over time uh, batteries will also meet its limits, but then it's more over to hydrogen and other stuff. So. But, but there's a long way to go before we have explored all the opportunities in the maritime sector. And, and I think that the, this, this kind of cooperation also with, with, the, with the main customers are very important. But, but one thing that I, and you, you also touched on, on, Fredrik, I think that to really, um, I, we have to be really strong on technology development, because I think that's the only way to succeed over time in this business. We, we cannot rely on, let's say, others technology or or let's say being licensed by from 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 abroad i think that we need to to really um, put more money into research development and innovation and commercialize these ideas because if we are not let's say um, uh, aspire to the to the podium 
on, on the battery technology, I think we will lose out even if we have a, a lot of good things. So, so this, how do we really ensure that enough uh, is now put into the advanced uh, research and development and also that we as companies do enough? Huh? And, and I think also looking at, at the value chains, there are some, uh, if not tough decision, I, I think a bit unusual decisions to, to be made. and. I mean, currently Europe is completely dependent on imports from China when it comes to rare earth metals. Um, and also, to, to, to be honest, I mean, many of the battery minerals are today sourced from countries that have questionable labor standards and, and low environmental requirements. And at the same time, I think we have the same situation both in Norway and Sweden that uh, it's, it's extremely hard to start a new mine. Mm. Uh, um, to, to get the permits to start a mine could could take tens to, to, to 20 years. I, we haven't started a new mine in in Sweden in a decade. This is something we're discussing very much with, with the government. But and, and it really looks at when we're talking vanadium, cobalt, graphite, lithium, these type of rare earth metals are present uh, as we see it both in, in Norway and Sweden. And I think it, it is it is tough in the general public to open up mines, but I think we have to be realistic and say, hey, we, we can create a sustainable production value chains for batteries, mm. starting from the raw materials to the extraction to the recycling. Then I think we have to be, be, be brave enough to, to make that type of decision and also have the discussion with politicians, how can we do this as sustainable as possible? It's not sustainable just sort of sending these type of mines away to other countries, in the same discussion as we're saying that uh, if, if we push away industry to, to other parts of the world, uh, we would become more sustainable. I think that is not the way forward. So we really have to look at those parts as well. Yeah, I, f I fully agree with you. And I think that uh, the what, what kind of footprint do we import? I think that will be more yeah. and more important. And that's been a discussion also on on carbon leakage uh, from Europe. But I think we need to have the same kind of discussion on the input material to to batteries, what kind of let's say, um, what kind of footprint do we import if we if we import this from from countries where we know that the standards are different and where the environmental footprint is is, is different? So, so I, I think that the idea of well, let's say looking at the, the the far upstream, that means the mining part of, of this value chain, is is also important, and that we also go, go with full force into the recycling part of it because it's it's really the most it's, it's so obvious that we have to take care of the material through the life cycle, and and uh, but I think on on the you said on the public side it's it's challenging with the, with the mining and 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 I think we all experience this whether it's wind power or or mining or whatever in 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 Norway as well. And but I think we just uh, we have to face the dilemmas and we have to we have to go into that discussion saying that you know we we to solve um, let's say one of the most important topics we we have to find also uh, sustainable ways of doing mining and getting the power into the batteries it's not only about let's say uh, let's say it's not only about driving the car with green energy it's it's also about what do, how do you produce those batteries i think uh, it, it's uh, very much the responsibility of uh, organizations such as nho and sn to 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 to, to take the educational challenge here and and explain why it's good to do this and what type of challenges we have if we do not uh, do this. And, and, a, and a bit on, on, on that note, and I know we were supposed to talk, to talk batteries, but I would like to take the opportunity just to say a couple of words on CCS, carbon capture uh, storage. I think that is a great opportunity for Sweden and Norway as, as well, and something that we could explore together. Could be huge, huge challenges uh, and opportunities on that side, and I think there, Norway is, is so much ahead, and we could do extremely good progress on on that side. So, uh, really, uh, uh, putting in a good word for CCS. Yeah, I, I, I know that will be a lot of hooray in in Norway for that comment, uh, Fredrik. So you'll be a friend a friend of Norway based on that one. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you will open up the border and I'll come and, and enjoy it as well. Ah, so that was the background <laughs> for the comments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but but I think you are absolutely right, and I think that um, uh, CCS is important. Hydrogen is going to be important. Batteries is going to be important. All of this is part of the green future, and I think that, uh, like we have the European Green Deal, it's uh, it's really also about the Nordic Green Deal, and uh, and as in many other topics, we should really spearhead uh, what is going on in Europe. So. 
So I really uh, look forward to, to um, this kind of discussions going forward because uh, we, this is too big to be solved in, by one company. It's too big to be solved by one country. This is really a, a global issue. And uh, at least the Nordic countries, I, I remember we have seen this, uh, this is figures about if you combine the GDP of the Nordic countries, we are not that. So, so with, and with the industrial competence we have, we should really be able to drive the development in certain areas. Now, my final comment as a head of uh, the North Vault presentation would be that it's it, it's I, it might seem as an easy journey, but it's been extremely tough journey for for North Vault when it comes to getting the right type of permits and the way they decided to locate where where they did. So I I think it's it's been a rough ride on the Swedish side as well to make that point. Yeah. But I'm, 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 we will come back to, to, to uh, North Vault, but uh, yeah. it's been a great a great journey that I've done. I think on the barriers, we, we are supposed also to give some comments on barriers. I think that uh, uh, there are of course always barriers, and you touched on some of them on the on the on the licensing and and permits and so on. Uh, of course, there is also a, a uh, from time to time you meet uh, let's say uh, a lot of um, uh, let's say stiffness in the in the public uh, let's say support system where you have to go. Uh, one new door every week to get uh, all the different support systems in place, but but that is all the things that we have given uh, input for to the Norwegian government that yeah, they have to, to to simplify the the support system and make it easier for uh, for business to 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 get through, let's say the, the with the, with the good ideas. But um, but I think these are these are minor things. I actually I think that. Uh, the, uh, we have to remove the barrier uh, that is about, let's say, um, sharing ideas. I think that is the most important thing. This is, as I said, this is too big to be sold by one company. We, uh, I think that we have to really create a uh, an are and create the arenas for cooperation uh, to to uh, going forward. And if we can uh, through this kind of uh, seminars and otherwise take down the barriers between us, uh, Frederick, between the countries and yeah. between the companies. I think that is important going forward. No, and I think this is uh, not something that is best solved on a, on a national level. I, I think it's extremely important that we do cooperate. And to your point, Arvid, uh, we can see uh, the leverage that the Nordic countries uh, get uh, down in, in Brussels. And we are, uh, as to your point, uh, the 10th largest uh, economy when we uh, join our forces and we also have a, a shared uh, history and a common legacy which means that it's it's easy to agree on things uh, but still doing it with enough tension to to create creativity mm. very good well uh, i guess our conversation goes towards the end and uh, yeah. this was supposed to be part of the visit by the crown prince uh, to, to sweden in, in may that didn't take place. Hopefully, they will come uh, next year so that you have a chance to uh, to see your beautiful country. Uh, but uh, anyhow, I think that uh, also uh, to the to those behind this uh, seminar, that uh, let's see what we can do next year. If we can have a follow up, and I am sure that in 12 months' time, a lot of things have happened uh, along the value chain in the batteries in in Norway and Sweden. I'm positive on that, and uh, thank you for arranging this. Uh, always a pleasure to to talk to you, Arvid. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, uh, Arvid and Fredrik. Um, Fredrik, you mentioned the electrification of the mining industry in Sweden. And Arvid, you mentioned the development of elect or electrification of maritime sector in Norway. And when it comes to electrification of transportation, we see that Norway and Sweden are leading interesting projects that can complement each, each other, being a good starting point for collaboration. You also mention that we do have access to raw materials in the Nordics. Um, we can extract in a sustainable way, um, with the North Vault project being the first one on, on cell production. Uh, we have the usage. We also are, are developing now the, the recycling uh, part uh, of the battery value chain. This shows that, as you mentioned, Frederick, we are very well positioned in the Nordic countries to be in the center of the European battery industry. So thank you for highlighting this. You spoke about Nordic collaboration in your conversation. 
And we do have with us the Swedish cell manufacturing company Northvolt that recently announced a joint venture together with Hydro in Norway. And we now want to welcome Emma Nerenheim to the digital stage. Um, you will give us uh, a presentation on how the Nordic cell manufacturers can produce the world's greenest lithium ion batteries and share some more insights of the status of the Northvolt project. So welcome to the stage, Emma. Thank you so much. Uh, and hello everyone, especially hello to everyone in Norway. It's, uh, it's an amazing journey that we are about to start, entering uh, yet another market uh, and, and bringing uh, our battery cells uh, and third party battery cells back to new battery raw materials. Uh, I'm going to come back to that, uh, but what I want to do is to start by just briefly introducing Northvolt and introducing myself. Uh, so my name is Emma Nierenheim. I'm the Chief Environmental Officer at Northvolt. Uh, it's uh, been now a journey for three years for me in the company and just a couple of months more uh, for the company as a whole. Uh, we are a, a very a rapidly growing startup uh, in Sweden. It was not obvious that the company would actually start in Sweden. It was uh, the founders moving back from Silicon Valley, California, with uh, several years of experience in building Tesla from the top uh, and from the start, and finding that the European market uh, has a, a huge journey uh, to be done in order to make it uh, in the electrification, especially in the transportation sector. Uh, interestingly, this was uh, the kickoff of basically all the activities that we see now. Uh, Peter and Paolo really managed to, to build an uh, incredibly strong team. Uh, they managed to find um, the perfect uh, plot for the first factory to be built in the Nordics here in Sweden. And they also managed to merge uh, the, the expertise from the Japanese and Korean uh, battery manufacturing that is already ongoing in Asia, uh, basically the leading battery manufacturing in the world, and uh, uh, together with the Silicon Valley spirit and the industrial traditions that we have here in the Nordics. So it's a pretty amazing team that is now here in Sweden starting to commission the first industrial plant in Westeros and also building the Skellefteå plant. And one of the main differentiators that, that were seen already from the start and were enabling also Europe to be in the future standing out significantly from basically all other battery manufacturers is the ability to build something that is fully sustainable from the start. So normally when I talk to uh, people about this, I say, let's do it right this time. And all the advantages we have here in the Nordics, we actually can do it right this time. Uh, we have a very strong, as I said, industrial tradition. And not only that, we also have a very strong authority tradition. So our authorities here in the Nordics are used to, in collaboration with industry, putting standards to protect not only people, but also the external environment uh, from potential harm, uh, but also looking ahead for several generations. And I think that utilizing this mixture of, of, of uh, in internationalizing uh, the industry again, that we have done so many times in the Nordics, uh, by, but also bringing in the strong tradition of doing it in a sustainable and well thought out way, I think is going to be key for the Nordics to be differentiating within Europe, but, but first and foremost for Europe uh, to be differentiating uh, globally. And this enables in its turn the vehicles sold from Europe to have a very strong uh, sustainability brand uh, all over. And I know that the Commission is ver working very strongly to uh, to preserve this uh, commitment and to make it uh, some kind of label or something that is very strong uh, going forward. Uh, the, the interesting um, 
a journey that we have seen so far in Europe is actually that we have introduced a lot of renewables. Um, the, that market has been growing uh, pretty impressively. Uh, I would say we have seen the introduction of solar, the price is going down for solar. We have seen wind we, and we have the strong tradition in hydropower and so forth. The challenges have been to create a market that is incentivizing the further build out, but also to manage the increase in, in, in energy demand in the industrial sector, which is pretty often a bottleneck uh, in also here in the Nordics, even though we have the hydropower. Uh, and, and to manage this, uh, to really uh, continue not only incentivizing the, uh, the build out of, of renewables, but also to manage uh, utilizing all the renewables in, in the best way, batteries have been lacking. Uh, and by introducing a strong battery industry, introducing batteries to the grid, introducing batteries to the transportation sector, we will, uh, for the first time, be able to move um, to move a, a power in time and in space. Uh, so challenging um, as it has been, it's, it's now possible to solve it. Something that this comes with is to really make sure that we do incentivize uh, further build outs so that we make sure that when we calculate carbon footprint, we are not calculating it based on, on, on paperwork. We are actually making sure that the feed of, of clean electricity is going directly to the source. Uh, and, and why do I say this? It's because I'm an idealist. I think it's very important that we are, that we are really doing this for a cleaner future and that we are really doing this to, uh, to make sure that we meet the Paris Agreement. Um, and, uh, and I think that this is also uh, in strong favor of the Nordics, that we have this advantage and that the direct feed of hydropower uh, will be really taken into account in the competition between other uh, uh, industrializations. And Northolt uh, did, as I said, we did set up very, very early, a very high ambition when it came to sustainability. Uh, I was hired early with a role to not from an administration point of view, and, but from a technology point of view and from a business perspective, uh, build a brand and build a solution oriented platform for making sure that our batteries are green, that our factories are green and that uh, we support the market in this transportation, uh, transformation. And uh, we are looking at this uh, in the entire um, loop of the battery, so from cell to cell. And we are also working very, very hard with, uh, with the mining uh, sector. We have a strong advantage, and I'm going to come back to that in the next slide. But the advantage that we have is something that we call the vertical integration, which means that we are doing most of the preparation of the materials on the cathode side ourselves. Uh, and, uh, and this means that we can have a very direct uh, relationship and partner up with the mining sector uh, and we can be very selective in who we buy from. And we have put a very strong backstop to some of the, uh, to some of the ethical standards that we have a challenge with in the sector. And we think that it's incredibly important that we continue having very high standards going forward. But we also put targets uh, to the mining sector and we work with this in several ways. One way is by collaborating with Epiroc in doing a strong, um, a strong technology development project for the mining sector. And we ac actually have um, uh, batteries in uh, heavy vehicles in the mining sector as we speak. But another way is to make sure that we select the right partners. And the most common question I often get, and that if we would have a Q&A, someone would ask me today, would be, how about Congo? How about DRC? What's your activity there? And we did very early identify DRC as one of the markets that we could probably forever not avoid. We also saw DRC as a market that is very strongly influencing 
uh, the sector as a whole. So even if we don't buy there from, uh, someone will. And, and we need to build the, 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 the battery industry in Europe strongly. So we're going to be influenced by it. So therefore, about two years ago, uh, me and our uh, chief operating officer, Paolo Ciruti, uh, paid a visit to Congo. We traveled around the mining sector and we basically saw and uh, most um, vari uh, varieties of, of mining operations that are to be found there. Uh, we discovered that it is possible to find really good entrepreneurs locally, but that it takes a lot of due diligence and audit uh, processes to be set in order to do it. And uh, as of today, we are not uh, signing any contracts with Congo, but we have the ambition to be uh, collaborating in Europe or ourselves being involved in some project that would support Congo into going into a strong industrialization. Because we think that in, that's important and we think that uh, any country that is so strongly influencing the sector should uh, also be part of industrializing and becoming, um, uh, becoming a strong uh, partner in this. Uh, so from the mining sector going forward, uh, we have the advantage of being with our factory. So material we buy goes into our factory and then we produce the cathode material ourselves. That gives us the advantage that everything onwards is under the roof of the factory uh, on the cathode side. And that's 100% uh, hydro and wind power, meaning that the factory is on 100% carbon free electricity. And this all together gives us the possibility to achieve uh, about 70% less uh, carbon dioxide footprint um, than, than the benchmark uh, factory today. But that, that's not enough. I mean, we still have to be considering uh, today's environmental issues, such as protecting the Baltic Sea that we are close to, and also making sure that we are prepared for the future so that um, and any, uh, any future generation that looks back didn't say to us that, hey, you guys, all you thought about was the climate change. But what about the water? What about the forest? What about the ecological footprint? What about biological diversity? So we are making sure that we are tracking uh, the entire production uh, from various perspectives. And we are also very proud to, uh, proud to be part of the European Commission initiative on the product environmental footprint analysis, which is a, a pretty uh, granulated analysis of uh, life cycle assessment that we do on all our products. Uh, so that's very important. Um, we're also deciding uh, that we, for our factories, will uh, make adaptations that bring us a little bit into the future. And one example of that is that we are recycling the salt that we produce instead of just um, disposing it into the sea, which is pretty normal, and so forth. Uh, but I think that the most important thing that we have uh, on our agenda is the recycling. And we did set up that uh, already from the start, um, meaning that we want to take back the batteries at the end of life. And... Uh, uh, we want to do that for so many reasons, but I think that the one that we really need to point out is that this market is growing so strongly and the, the raw material need is huge. It's very, uh, this is, was pointed out as a, the only market risk, given that the buyer side of the market is, is very strongly growing. And, and what we see is that all the material that we import to Europe, we really need as as a team within Europe to make sure that we have a plan for making those materials stay within Europe and for utilizing those, not only recycle them somewhere, but making sure that we recycle them back to battery grade materials. And especially for cobalt, that is um, increasing so rapidly in demand. And this is basically the only sustainable way to, to refine it and, and recycle it. So it's, it's really key that we learn to do this together and that we set up a short supply chains for the recycling so that each battery finds its way back uh, into the, uh, to the battery production uh, cycle again 
uh, at the end of its life. And the key to do this is really to cut um, the supply chain. It's to make sure that materials do not travel around the world before they end up again in, in, in production. And it's to make sure uh, that we take as full responsibility as possible. And I think it was uh, one of the previous speakers also talked a lot about this uh, from the mining perspective. But in this case, um, it's actually about making sure that we here in the Nordics learn how to really prepare these materials uh, ourselves and to make sure that we understand uh, the complexity of that, that we understand uh, how to uh, mitigate potential uh, harmful effects uh, and, that we, and that, that we take this production under a roof in the Nordics uh, and that we do uh, make sure that uh, we buy from the most sustainable sources. A normal battery manufacturer uh, in a benchmark factory would buy their material here. So they would buy the anode and the cathode somewhere from and they would start the electrode manufacturing, so coating the foils, uh, and then they would go into cell assembly. Some do modules and packs. Um, and, and Northvolt calls this the vertical integration, and I, in the future, will try to, um, to rephrase it into a circular uh, integration. But vertical integration really means that under the roof of Northvolt, we go all the way from the uh, metal chemicals through to recycling. And we will even introduce an integration of the recycling into the metal chemicals production to make sure that it's, it's as seamless as possible and that we cut as many um, production steps as we possibly can. But primarily that this site that we found in the, uh, in the northern Sweden that has a very low ecological footprint, that has 100% renewable energy, that has um, a very strong feed of power from renewable sources, and, and that has a very strong industrial tradition that we do as much as possible under those conditions so that we really utilize uh, the, the perfect plot that we have and the perfect uh, industrial setup that we are building there. A little bit about how we are now expanding in, in, in Europe. So if we go back to uh, just uh, uh, three years back, we were in a very extensive site selection process for, for finding the perfect plot and the perfect site. Uh, we were between uh, a number of cities in Sweden and Finland. Uh, in the end, we decided to split the site into one industrial site in Westeros where we would build a smaller plant uh, with one protect production step of each of the ones that I showed you in the last slide, but where all those steps would be fully industrialized, so full-scale machines in each, uh, in each step, but not fully optimized. And then we also decided that in the Nordics, uh, in the northern Sweden in Skellefteå, we would build the Giga factory uh, to produce uh, uh, in the first phase, 16 gigawatt hour, but in the expansion, 40 gigawatt hours. And since then, we have also expanded to be building a battery systems factory in Poland, in Gdansk. Mm, the one I mentioned that is supplying uh, mining equipment and, uh, and other uh, uh, systems. Uh, very strong uh, uh, for the electrification of the grid sector, which I think is going to be key uh, in order to, to make this electrification happen. And then we have also announced two uh, very, very interesting joint ventures, one with Volkswagen in Germany uh, to, build, uh, uh, to build capacity for cell manufacturing, and now most recently the Hydrovolt um, company in, here in uh, Norway, um, in Fredrikstad, uh, which we are very excited about, uh, and I'm going to come back uh, to that one. Uh, something small about the manufacturing in, in Westeros. We, are, we have been commissioning this plant for a while now. We are very, very proud of this plant. 
it is a small plant in our world, but it's still in this industrial area um, where, where we have the, the uh, ABB factories for machines and robots, um, for instance, it's still the biggest plant. Uh, here we are uh, now uh, commissioning each and every one of the process steps. So if you look at the logics here in this picture that is from above, we have the material production here, and then we have a corridor pr to protect uh, the, the material production from the clean and dry room area, which is very, very sensitive. And then we have slurry preparation for the coaters. And in this long building here, uh, we have coaters uh, that code, uh, coat anode and cathode um, on copper and aluminum foil, uh, what you can see here. This is how it looks like. This is the long coater. It's one machine, and this is actually on the anode side. Um, and then after that, it's these clean and dry rooms where we have uh, the, the cell assembly. So the, the foil is cut. It's put together with a separator in between. It's put in their casing, and the electrolyte is filled and so forth. And then we have also a very nice office area where we have now about 300 people sitting and working every day. Uh, and speaking of Corona, we have kept the production and the office open, uh, but we offer testing programs and we offer uh, and we have a demand for for um, a mask for everyone. This is a rendering of the same plant. And why do I want to show this? Is to show you that we are building the recycling plant in an adjacent uh, facility. And this will be up and running now 2020, this summer. So we are also installing now, as we speak, uh, in the facility here to the right. Uh, it's going to be all the recycling steps. So it will be uh, discharge, dismantling, uh, crushing, sorting, and then uh, a developed hydrometallurgical process that takes the material to battery grade. Uh, we developed this now over two and a half years. And... Um, it's going to be really exciting to, to get that proof of concept out for, for the process. Uh, looking forward, we expect to be still expanding on our land here in Vestros. And we expect the recycling plant to be here. We will also build a safety and environmental lab uh, to continue building our strong brand in this. And then um, together with that, the performance and life lab. Uh, we believe that any manufacturer in, uh, in the, on the European market will have to be differentiating on, on sustainability. But that doesn't take away that you ha we have to be the high, uh, producing batteries with the highest performance and at a very strong cost uh, advantage to be able to compete on this market. So even though we think that the sustainability is going to be hugely important, we do not expect that to be a premium battery. We expect that we will still have to be competitive um, on, on all the other factors. Meanwhile, up in Skellefteå, uh, I'm actually jumping in the car uh, just after this going up there since the flights are a little bit limited. Uh, we have the giga scale uh, construction ongoing uh, for, for the first 16 gigawatt hour block. And this is, uh, it's pretty amazing when you, when you see it, but it's, um, uh, this is the upstream building. It's going to keep the same logic. Uh, and then we are building the two downstream line here for the 16 gigawatt hour uh, and some other adjacent buildings for material handling and so forth. If we look at the rendering, it keeps the same logic, so material preparation here. And then we have the, the coating and the cell assembly. And then the final blocks here are for charging and discharging and maturing the batteries before going out uh, to customers um, here. Something that is uh, really going to differentiate Northvolt uh, is how we work with data. And I think that I would really like to encourage anyone that goes into this business to take a look at this, because uh, we talk a lot about traceability, 
when we talked about the product and environmental footprint. But what we see normally is that uh, a lot of the industrial players need to work with average values because there is really very poor quality of the data that is out there for tracking the actual footprint of each of the batteries. And we were lucky that Peter and Paolo could bring with them from California uh, Landon Mossberg, who is our chief digital officer, who also uh, had that function for the Tesla building the, that global infrastructure of communicating with the, with the vehicles. And what we will set up is something we call the connected batteries that will allow for us to trace uh, the materials from the source, uh, the level of recycled materials, the, the, the carbon footprint, but also uh, performance um, uh, performance footprint of the batteries and also of course trace everything within production and if we can't do this we can't really say uh, what happened to each of the cells uh, and how we can improve um, from a footprint point of view of course but also from a performance point of view uh, how the cells will be uh, b behaving in the future so we think that this is going to be one of the key deliverables from Northvolt that is going to enable all this, including sustainability. Uh, because uh, that tracking is so important for, for, for making sure we have key learnings and for making sure that we can advise the customers in the best way when it comes to the, uh, to the life of the battery. And I think key, sometimes I get the question when we talk about uh, recycling versus second life and I I'm a promoter of having the batteries on the market as long as possible but what I would like to encourage is to make sure that the batteries can actually stay in their fit for purpose use as long as possible so not having them uh, refurbished for other purposes where they might not be optimal but actually making sure that the batteries can can be on their market and that they're brought home in time for service, um, that they are brought home before they become critical, uh, and, that they are, uh, and that they are staying on the market as long as possible in the best, uh, their best performance, and then being recycled uh, to new uh, modern batteries with new fit for purpose optimization. You can see how much time I have. Yeah, I'm, I'm on this. Uh, the last slide I really want to, um, to talk about is uh, my, own, um, uh, my own business unit, Revolt, and how we have now uh, successfully launched the Hydrovolt uh, joint venture together with Hydro, Norsk Hydro, which I'm so excited about. Uh, we are so proud about the Norwegian market. Uh, we are so impressed by how, by how fast and how independently from the rest of the world uh, you have de developed your EV um, uh, fleet uh, and how brave you've been in just uh, solving issues uh, as you went along with this. And this gives a huge opportunity for us that work in recycling because your market is, is very mature and uh, there are already batteries uh, coming back uh, to recycling. So there is a huge experience in, uh, in batteries already in Norway. And uh, the collaboration with Batteriretur and the collaboration with Hydro, that is also very strong in recycling of, of materials since before, we think is going to be key in building um, our future uh, fleet for returning the batteries back. Um, so that we can make new battery grade materials uh, instead of being so dependent on the global uh, raw material industry. Uh, so what we will do is that we will collect the batteries and we will have a very strongly integrated collaboration together with Batteri Retour in Fredrikstad. Um, and then uh, we will, uh, together with Batteri Retour, we will discharge and dismantle them so that they, they become harmless. Uh, and that they become in a form where we take out really the cells and the modules that needs to be recycled, where other materials are, of course, recycled on other markets than the battery market. Or um, they take a loop out, for instance, to Norsk Hydro for aluminum and becoming new fresh so uh, foil uh, for, for shipment back to the factory.
And then we will have a crushing and sorting unit. And this is, it might sound easy, but this is actually becoming a pretty delicate process uh, where the purity of the material is really determining the, the success of the, of the plant. And for the something called black mass, which is the material that contains the anode and cathode material, will be uh, shipped to Northvolt and the aluminum parts in that will be shipped to, to uh, Norsk Hydro for recycling. Um, what we will do then in Skellefteå is that we will extract nickel, manganese, cobalt and lithium. And it's worth mentioning that lithium has not been recycled to a great extent before. So that is really uh, something where we also will differentiate and that will have a huge impact on the footprint of the battery. Uh, and then these batteries will become uh, these materials will become new bot uh, batteries within the Northvolt production that will then uh, feed the market and enable the customers to have uh, recycled labeled uh, batteries going out to customers. Something that is really, really uh, asked for by the end customers, on, especially on the European market. And thank, thank you, you. Uh, from Sweden. Sweden. Yeah, thank you, Emma. And uh, it's amazing uh, to hear, hear the story about uh, your rapidly growing startup, which isn't a startup anymore necessarily. <laughs> and, um, and that fast journey you've had uh, and, and, and the business model you are at now is, is very, very inspiring and interesting. And I'm looking forward to, to continue those uh, conversations in the industry in the Nordics going forward. Um, you mentioned also automation and, and uh, the importance of that, which I think is close to my heart. So thank you for bringing up that uh, point. And um, we are nearing today's uh, seminar, uh, but we have one last small announcement uh, to make. So thank you to you, Emma, and thank you to Northvolt. So we uh, want to welcome Lars Petter Maltby uh, from the Eide cluster, uh, who is here representing a new initiative that has come into fruition in conversations and collaborations between the Eide cluster, the industry, and us in Invest in Norway. Um, Lars Petter, a few, a few people know what you're about to present, so I will not keep the fans <laughs> waiting. Uh, so please share the good news. So welcome, Lars Petter. Well, thank you very much, uh, Noda and Thea, uh, for allowing us to use this opportunity to uh, launch what we call an industrial initiative. Um, since 2016, we have actually been working through the IDA cluster with, uh, in a cooperative atmosphere uh, on battery materials. So our members, Elkem, Glencore, Nickelwerk and Norsk Hydro has been very important uh, actors in this. And we've seen over time that, uh, you know, this industry is really matured uh, as many other experiences now that there is huge opportunities and industrial opportunities within the uh, battery space. So consequently, we are launching what we call Battery Norway uh, to strengthen the uh, battery in initiatives from an industrial and political arena. Um, so, a little bit of background. We heard today from first uh, Commissioner Marosevkovic, uh, for sure, I mean, the battery sphere is dominated by China and Asia, and, uh, and Europe is now really leading the, um, the way for a battery value chain buildup. Uh, and it's important as part even in, in the European Green Deal. I mean, uh, batteries are important for the climate, the gas reductions, circular economy, and probably most importantly, also as part of the industrial strategy. Um, in Norway, thanks to Sintef and Institute of Energy Technology, Norway has been actually participating quite well and primarily on the scientific areas. And we feel that there is a need for industry also to get more involved, to realize and get the effect of the R&D that is being done. So in, in Europe, you have uh, what was talked about today, the initiatives of uh, so uh, important projects of common interests, Inno Energy, European Battery Alliance, uh, Batteries Europe are very important areas, but we feel and uh, we hear that not all actors can participate in all these arenas all the time. So 
it's our initiative to to do a little bit more of a national coordination that can add value to what the companies are doing themselves. Uh, what was also talked about today by uh, by Nicholas uh, by Frederick Persson and Arvid Moss um, is that you know what makes more sense is also to cooperate between our Nordic neighbors and, and we saw perfect examples of that be uh, through Northvolt and Norsk Hydro and and we know that there are more contacts also between in the in the Nordic area so. Nordic and Sweden are really compl complementary in terms of the industrial structure and experience of Norway. Sweden as the, I would say, the Nordic industrial locomotive, Finland's mineral and processing competencies, and Norway with renewable power availability and also the process industry competencies and the materials uh, competencies and specialization of, of products and which is primarily exported into the European uh, market. Uh, so uh, we, we think that the, uh, the Nordic arena can be utilized uh, to, um, to even further and to, to build sort of a, uh, a, a, an atmosphere or a common atmosphere between the Nordic countries and, and Battery Norway would very much like to take to facilitate such a role on behalf in Norway. Uh, similar like we are doing today. Also, I think probably most importantly is that uh, we, we saw in Norway a couple of weeks ago the Norwegian government launching a new stimulus package for green transition and transformative technologies. And batteries was mentioned as a key area, but also in the same package it's mentioned offshore wind, hydrogen, circle economy, Maritime transition by economy, there's a lot of things that we need to do to, to transform our industry uh, infrastructure uh, industry and also to deliver on those uh, main goals of, of climate gas reductions. Uh, and, and we feel that it's important to lift the battery space in Norway because it can, as you mentioned earlier today, Nora, it can create 10,000s of jobs. It can increase the export values of, uh, in, uh, of, of what they're doing today. And, it, and, and even more importantly also, it creates more value on the renewable powder, power that we produce in Norway. So through our, I would say, Batman project and the cooperation with Invest in Agder, we, as you see in the picture, we launched, uh, uh, we had a meeting in December last year. There was enormous interest. It's much broader than the important key players. So uh, we think that uh, we, 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 there is uh, absolutely room for more cooperation, more human interaction between the uh, battery space, such as the one we are seeing today, unfortunately on a webinar, but that's a very effective way of doing it also. We think that it's important to create the necessary cooperation arenas and, and this should be also driven by industry so that it facilitates the development of the Norwegian battery ecosystem. So what we've said so far is, uh, is really uh, a start. Uh, the objectives of Battery Norway are to consolidate and development of a national strategy, expand the number of companies and the areas within activity which Norwegian battery in the value chain uh, do. Uh, and also Norway has a very good scientific competence, but there is a need to educate more people within the industrial skills area. We have to realize on, on, on the research and development that's being done. And in addition, in a small country like Norway, it makes sense to look at industrial infrastructure uh, in a shared example, for instance, through catapults like future materials and sustainable energy so that we can share the facilities to the extent that we can, rather than individually build up everything by ourselves. As already mentioned earlier today, so I will not uh, talk much about that, but uh, it's, it's really the cooperation within the Nordics and the EU is critical. And lastly, Battery Norway will assist and partner with Invest in Norway to attract more investments to Norway. So, Finally, uh, Battery Norway, as launched today, is only a start. We have reached out to Freyr by Beyonder and Moro as the battery producers 
Elkin and Glencore Nickelwerk as uh, material producers and as our first dialogue partners to ensure that we are creating value for industry. So Battery Norway will be for the whole battery ecosystem so that uh, we hope that as many companies as possible that find this relevant and want to be participant in a common platform uh, so that companies and entities actively within the va battery value chain join this initiative. We plan to sit down with these initial partners uh, shortly and to reconfirm those objectives that were put forward and propose an initial path which is based on the needs of the industry. And I think uh, I have to underline it even more importantly that this is absolutely in order for the benefit of the companies themselves. So they should be in the driver's seat. They should tell what this, the content of this should be, and it should be industrial driven. So on your screen, you see that we have already put some contact, uh, contact name up, and we hope that, uh, that companies gradually come in. I think it's very important that we first sit down with these uh, first uh, founding fathers, I would say, to, to set the direction. And then we, of course, we will invite everybody that can see this as a benefit uh, to, to, to join this initiative as well. So thank you very much. And I leave it to you. First, uh, a lot of the... A lot of the listeners today are uh, interested in learning more about that and, and, and uh, reaching out to par per your invitation. Uh, I know that me, myself and my colleagues in Invest in Norway and in Innovation Norway is excited to collaborate on this uh, going forward. So, Thea, what's up next? We are reaching now the end of today's seminar. And I think I am on safe ground uh, when I say that we all are all looking forward to see how the Nordic ecosystem will continue to grow. Um, and we started off this seminar this morning uh, with representatives from the Norwegian uh, government. And I don't know about you, Nora, but I sensed that we had strong support and that also the Prime Minister and uh, Minister of Petroleum and Energy highlighted and anticipated collaboration, Nordic collaboration, uh, on the Nordic battery scene. Um, yes, I agree with you. Uh, collaboration uh, was also highlighted uh, by the vice president, exemplified uh, by the European Battery Alliance. So mm. when we collaborate in Norway, we need to collaborate in the Nordics, and then we <laughs> collaborate in uh, Europe and then, uh, and then the world. So um, also, I, I noted that um, uh, all of it mentioned that uh, in 12 months time, we will see more uh, collaborations going forward. So that's that's going to be interesting. Um, the fact that reduction of the need for primary critical raw materials is feasible through circular economy mm. uh, puts Norway and the Nordics at an advantage due to our long history and competence within circular projects, which mm. uh, several mentioned here today. And we also understand that uh, through EFTA, there is also a chance for Norway to join in the important work around IPSE. And uh, we're looking forward to see how these uh, conversations uh, continue going forward. Mm. Investments, they sure are important. And we do see um, that the private sector and industry are strongly committed uh, to boost the ecosystem. Um, the Hydrovolt being an important example, uh, which was highlighted in uh, Emma's presentation from, from Northvolt. And also from the discussion between uh, Arvid Moss and Fredrik Persson, we received strong signals that Nordic collaboration will be vital in the growth of the European battery sector. And they also highlighted that we are well positioned in the Nordics to be in the center of the European battery value chain. Yes, and uh, we also heard that uh, batteries are the key to cutting emissions from transportation and industry. There is a growing consensus that we need to build a sustainable battery value chain in Europe. And uh, there are several good reasons why Norway and the Nordics can play a significant role in such a European battery value chain. One being uh, mentioned several times today that we are powered almost on 100% renewable energy. 
and our long and strong history of delivering high quality materials already to Europe will aid in manifesting this position. And uh, that was our key wrap up today. Um, we are missing mentioning one thing. We would like to mark it. We have a next webinar coming up on the 10th of August. Before I um, introduce that, uh, I would like to mention that electrification, electrification of the transport sector has been mentioned several times today. And this will be the topic for our third webinar, uh, which will take place in September. But first, we will meet again on the 10th of August. Um, and in the second webinar, we will um, focus on policy, sustainable material, materials, reuse and recycling. And for those of you ha who have registered for today's uh, event, uh, you will get an email afterwards with a recording of this webinar and you will also get a link uh, where you can register for the next webinar. We apologize for some uh, technical issues uh, uh, this morning, but uh, everything is, is recorded, so you will get it afterwards. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, we, we are on, on that and I'm um, you are sure Lars Petter has invited uh, into conversations through the ID cluster and Battery Norway. I sh know that there are several other conversations ongoing that are exciting at the moment. So I think we hope that this will help boost some more conversations and collaborations going forward. And the ProSyn conference, which the second webinar will take place uh, on 10th and 11th of August, is hosted by the ID cluster and, and many more partners. And the Norwegian Minister of Trade will attend that, so we hope you will too. Uh, that's a wrap. Uh, we wish you all a wonderful summer. And uh, like the Vice President urges to, let's recharge our batteries and enjoy some relaxing days off. So thank you to everyone participating and speaking and uh, to all you listening in. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you.